All men are enemies, all animals are comrades. Welcome, my mere mortal lads, to another round of the book reviews. My name is Kyron, host of the Mere Mortals podcast, but also this one where I dive deeper into the books that I'm reading to give you the juicy information contained within to extract some themes you might not have realized and to also learn more about comrades and the USSR. Indeed, we do have Animal Farm by George Orwell. So this book was published in 1945 and it is thin, only 88 pages in total. It'll take you an hour and a half probably to get through. It's an allegorical satire criticizing the USSR and Joseph Stalin. So this takes the form of a group of talking animals led by the pigs who revolt against the humans of Manor Farm. And they basically have this revolt and then they start to try and create their ideal society of animals led by animals without the humans interfering and whatnot. So they, they try and create this paradise and this is done through the form of animalism, which is their kind of ideology, their way of, of knowing what is good and what is right. And this is how the principles of their, of their utopia will be formed. It's told through a kind of third person viewpoint from a narrator who sees all of these animals. And we watch as the story progresses as the animals start to find, okay, maybe this, uh, this utopia isn't all that's kind of cut out to be in so that's things are going bad along the way. So we'll leave it at there for the moment and jump onto the author. So Eric Blair, also known as George Orwell, his pen name. He was born in 1903 and died in 1950. I don't think he needs explanation on this channel. I hope not because he is the author of my favorite book of all time, 1984, which is very easily, I think the best book of all time. And this book in particular, Animal Farm, was formed from his experiences by fighting in the Spanish Civil War and, and most famously in another book of his, Homage to Catalonia, and also working in the BBC. And so he kind of got this aspect of journalism, of, of people, of psychology, and he wrapped it all up into this kind of one neat package. So let's jump into the first theme, which is communism, great in principle, terrible in practice. So what is communism and, and why does it kind of get started? And it, and it seems to start off with something innate. There is just something in humans where we feel the pain of injustice, where we you know, need Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We need shelter, we need food, we, need, we have these desires, these actual physical real world needs that need to be met. Uh, we have values of honor and hard work and maybe you could even call this karma. And we notice things like inefficiencies in the world, we notice stuff and so there can be times where we look at the systems that we create of how we live together and go, that's a shitty one. You know, this is a, a crappy system with kings and queens who, you know, just they, they're parasites. They live off the land of us hard workers, of us proles and whatnot. And this is kind of where communism starts. And so we kind of have these, all these philosophies that start to come with that, you know, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. And so this is the idea that you, we should all have this kind of communal working spirit and that there shouldn't be people who are leeches and parasites who have this extraordinary wealth who live way better than the rest of us whilst there is in, injustice and inequality in the world. Now, this is all nice and, and well, but reality tends to set in. So those are some great ideas, but what, what happens when you change things up and you try and put other things in place. And so I'm gonna jump onto page 39 here where the revolution has happened on Animal Farm and they're, they're starting to to have to, I guess, you know, put into action their own farming practices and whatnot. So the animals were not badly off throughout that summer in spite of the hardness of their work. If they had no more food than they had in Jones's day, this was the old farmer, at least they did not have less. The advantage of only having to feed themselves and not having to support five extravagant human beings as well was so great that it would, would have taken a lot of failures to outweigh it. And in many ways, the animal method of doing things was more efficient and saved labor. Such jobs as weeding, for example, could be done with a thoroughness impossible to human beings. And again, since no animal now stole, it was unnecessary to fence off pasture from arable land, which saved a lot of labor on the upkeep of hedges and gates. Nevertheless, as the summer wore on, various unforeseen shortages began to make themselves felt. There was the need of paraffin oil, nails, string, dog biscuits, and iron for the horse's shoes, none of which could be produced on the farm. Later, there would also be need for seeds and artificial manures, besides various tools. And finally, the machinery for the windmill. How these were to be procured, no one was able to imagine. 
So we kind of have this, this setting in of reality. Okay, we've kicked out all the bad people and maybe we've gotten a couple of benefits because now there's just there's not as many people, there's not as many kings and queens, or in the case of USSR, Russia, this was the the so the um, the Tsars, these kind of you know super princes, this bourgeois class of all of these people. We've gotten rid of them. Beautiful, and and so you kind of see some benefits from this. But then there's also the reality of okay, how are we going to feed ourselves? What is else is going to change? You know, and this is where there's this kind of heuristic called Chesterton's fence comes into place and. There's an asking, you know, if a fence is in a field and you want to tear down that fence as kind of a revolutionary, it's important to understand why the fence is there in the first place. And so with communism, you can kind of see they didn't care. They didn't care why there might have been princes or ruling classes or things like this. It didn't matter. And it didn't matter if they had a role to fill either. And so they would just get rid of them. And so this is where you know, did the humans do anything on animal farm is a question that the animals might have been willing to ask because sure, they were tough, sure, they were arbitrary in some of their rules and sure, they would have these injustices of killing animals, of working them hard and whatnot. But did they do anything at all? Was there reasons for this? And so this is where I guess unintended consequences, which is a big part of communism tends to get, come in. As I said, it's great in principle, but it's terrible in practice. And so this is where we see, okay, you know, jealous farmers come in and try and destroy this movement. They do destroy the windmill, which is going to provide prosperity to all of these other animals. We see kind of the best of the animals, they get abused. And so the, the main workhorse, uh, forgetting his name at the very moment, uh, he, he gets basically worked to death. And so there is no uh, boxer was his name. He, he gets worked to death essentially until he breaks down and, and can't, can't be, is, is of no more use. We see that this kind of reality of, of the harsh winters of, of, the, of life on the farm kind of trumps the ideas that come from the pigs, that come from this animalism. And it, in the end, things aren't going as great as they think they were. And in fact, they, they're tending to get a little bit worse. And then it goes from a little bit worse to a lot of bit worse. And I don't think I need to explain further of why communism <laughs> killing 100 million people in, in the kind of 20th century is, is, a, is a bad thing to have happened. But this also then finally gets us onto, I suppose, the second theme, which is ideologies. The problem is the humans. And so we have in this book, this animalism, uh, we had communism in the real world, we had fascism, we had all sorts of isms and basically all ideologies end in this kind of ism. The, the ism is, the, is the, the set of rules of things that, that happen. And uh, there te tends to be this kind of distortion over time. So rules are great. If we could all follow the rules, then we could choose which rules we want to play by. We could know exactly what is gonna happen in the future. We could plan for it. But this doesn't tend to happen and, and they tend to change. And so I'm gonna jump onto two aspects of the book here. So on page 15, we have the seven commandments of, of animalism. And these are, whatever goes upon two legs is an enemy. Whatever goes upon four legs or has wings is a friend. No animal shall wear clothes. No animal shall sleep in a bed. No animal shall drink alcohol. No animal shall kill any other animal. All animals are equal. And this is brilliant. You know, the, they've got these rules. They, they're very clear on what they, what they stand for. And this is all, if these are followed, you know, it's going to lead us to a better time, a better place where the life will be better than it once previously was. Unfortunately, we, we see this distorting of these rules. And as we get closer towards the end of the book, so this is on page 84, we, we see what all of these rules have condensed down to right at the end. And so instead of the seven commandments, there was just now a single one. So for once, Benjamin consented to break his rule and he read out to her what was written on the wall. There was nothing there now except a single commandment. It ran, and this is all in capitals. All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. And then, yeah, that's basically, <laughs> that basically shows how these dis distortions have been happening. And there was other examples in the book where instead of it being, uh, you know, no animal shall kill any other animal, it becomes no animal shall kill any other animal uh, without just cause or without reason. 
No animal shall drink alcohol except blah, blah, blah. No animal shall sleep in a bed uh, with sheets. And the, and the pigs are saying, no, but we, we, we only, we don't sleep in beds with sheets, you know, that sort of deal. And this is the kind of thing that happens. Is it subtle or is it a natural process? Is it, is it manipulative? Is it evil? Are people willingly doing this? In the case of this book, you say, okay, yeah, it's the pigs. They are the ones who are changing the rules. They are, they're, they're making it so that things are easier for them, are better for them, so they don't have to work out in the fields. And this is where it's like, oh, okay, this is, okay, you're, you're changing things. This isn't as, a, as what it used to be. Uh, we have this aspect of chaos and entropy as well. And this is kind of the default. So if you're doing a revolution, if you've got a new ideology and trying to put it into place, it's not just going to fix itself out and, and everything will work. No, someone must kind of be the leader behind it, driving it forward, making sure other people are following the rules, making sure that things happen the way they're meant to happen and whatnot. And this is where we kind of have this real analogy of between there's the, the lead pig, pig, Napoleon, and this is Stalin. And, and so what happens in the book? Well, the lead pig, Napoleon, he becomes you know, fatter, corrupter, he experiences, you know, he betrays his one of the other main pigs. This is Snowball, who has the parallel of Leon Trotsky in the real world. He becomes anger, you know, full of rage and, and, and hatred. He becomes power hungry and just wants more and more and, and extracts more and more from Animal Farm and from all of these other people, all other people, all these other animals and by redu reducing their rations and whatnot. And we see at the end, right at the end of the book that he's, he's kind of celebrating with these other farmers who have now come in. And these are the human farmers who they hated at the very beginning of the book. And they're laughing and they're joking in the farmhouse and they're drinking and the other animals are watching and they see how the pigs have now become the humans and they're indistinguishable from once what they were ostentatiously against what they said you know we're going to overthrow these people and enact a new system and you know here's the new system it's kind of same as the old <laughs> welcome and so this is where it's like okay once again humans are, are kind of the the weak link in the chain here of this ideology there's they were meant to be this one way and you know we're going to do things differently and it kind of slides back to back as the way things were except a bit worse uh, we also have this twisted psychology and it's not just the, the ringleaders, the bosses, the people in charge and power who have kind of distorted what the ideology is meant to be. It's the people down below as well, the proletariat, the plebs, the, the animals, the, the workers. And these are the ones where we see, okay, it's not just, it's not just the leaders. So we jump onto page 52 and 53 and there's been somewhat of a cleansing. The, the four young pigs who were trying to follow the ideals of, of the ideology of, of animalism, they get slaughtered. And then the three hens who had been the ringleaders in the attempted rebellion over the eggs now came forward and stated that Snowball had appeared to them in a dream and incited them to disobey Napoleon's orders. They too were slaughtered. Then a goose came forward and confessed to having secreted six ears of corn during the last year's harvest and eaten them in the night. Then a sheep confessed to having urinated in the drinking pool, urged to do this, so she said, by Snowball. And two other sheep confessed to having murdered an old ram, an especially devoted follower of Napoleon, by chasing him round and round a bonfire when he was suffering from a cough. They were all slain on the spot. And so the tale of confessions and executions went on until there was a pile of corpses lying before Napoleon's feet. And the air was heavy with the smell of blood, which had been unknown there since the expulsion of Jones. So we see... Okay, people are confessing to stuff they're not even, they didn't even do. Or if they did do, it was such a minor offense. And yet there is this just huge overreaction uh, of, of the people in charge to, okay, we're going to kill you. You know, not only does this happen, and but all the an other animals who witness this, what is their response to this injustice, to this tragedy, to this crime? They just go along with it. And in fact, they somehow get it in their warped heads that, it was my fault, it was my responsibility. I need to work even harder because other people are, uh, are doing things wrong. And so for animalism to live on, you know, I must be the strong one. And, and we see this with Boxer who then, instead of getting up half an hour or 45 minutes early, 
each day. He gets up an hour early each day to do more work. So everyone kind of contributes to the failing of the ideology. And so it's not just the people in charge. It's the, it's, it's everyone. It's just a human thing. So this is where, okay, if you've got an ideology where you've got these strict and set rules, the rules change, people change. And this is why it can lead to such huge genocides or huge travesties such as the Gulag Archipelago, another amazing book if you want to read about the, the horrors and tragedies that happened in the due to a system like animalism, like communism. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty nasty. So <laughs> watch out for it. <laughs> so some observations and, and takeaways I'll, I'll get into. The book itself is just powerful. And I think it's powerful because of its condensation. He takes all of these separate aspects and somehow melds them into these, I guess, like simple, small sentences or paragraphs, which convey so much. So we see all the, the, the pride of these animals. And even though conditions aren't so great, you know, it's still animal farm. We're still the ones in charge. We're, we're not ruled over by any Jones or humans or anything like that, even though the pigs are starting to kind of act like it. We have the, the kind of old wise men and Benjamin, the donkey, these people who kind of know what's going to go on, but they, they have no power to stop it themselves. We have the propaganda tactics of Squealer of how he changes and distorts words, how he literally changes words of the seven commandments and kind of gets caught in the act of it as well. We, I, I just, there's so much in this, which is so condensed to where, you know, it's, it's not, it's not a book about communism per se, even though it is making a, a, a direct comparison with Stalin and whatnot, it's it's really a book about ideologies and and how how these things get warped and twisted and and how so many small little aspects kind of feed into this machine that that ends up creating really bad outcomes for humans. And I think George Orwell really knew people and he really knew systems based on his life and his following of principles. He used to be a communist and then he saw how that ended up for people during the Spanish Civil War. You know, he used he, he used to do all of these things. He saw it for himself and then he he explained it clearly and directly. And this is why I think kind of the fable also holds power in this case. Maybe it wasn't as clear and direct as going, Stalin did this, and then Stalin did that, and then Leon Trotsky did this, and Leon Trotsky did that, and then the proletariat did this. And you could probably write a book like that with the same amount of words, but I think there's something in the anthropomorphic animals. So this is, you know, adding human qualities onto other things. And in this case, it being the animals at, at Manor Farm. And it allows somewhat for simplicity to, to kind of shine through. We see, okay, yeah, you know, the animals are behaving in this way and we can kind of understand it with they're simple creatures. It's, it's, a, it's sort of allowing the complexity of humans to be transferred over onto simple things. And we can kind of see, oh, okay, Humans are simple and this is why, you know, they might self-confess to crimes. This is why they might ignore the, the tragedies or the slaughters going on in front of them because they've got a propagandist who is very sneaky and is, has a great way with words. We can see how rules change over time. All of these sorts of things. I think it's this, this fable, the, the, the beast fable, the, the way that Orwell has written this book is just really, really allows the the underlying aspects of the ideology of communism to, to kind of shine through. And this is where I guess some historical context is also needed. I can well imagine in the future, this book not having the impact it's had certainly on me, but I think on many of people because it is just too far in the past, you know, Stalin, he, when did he die in the 1950s, sixties, maybe, uh, there's, there's just so much time, so much, wrapped up with this there were people alive today just barely who lived under communism you know in the next 20 years that they're not going to really be around anymore and this is where we can kind of see okay even though this book is so powerful like i can just see it maybe it lose some of its edge because you kind of needed to know about stalin about the historical context of of the gulags of of what happens when people get to power and when, you know, what are the end outcomes of an ideology, which is, gets twisted and distorted over time.
I, th I, th I think that kind of stuff can happen. So in summary, if I was a writer, this would make me want to give up writing. <laughs> I think it's just so tightly written. Every sentence feels like it belongs. Every paragraph, it, it explains so much in so little words. I would, I'd be very depressed if I was trying to <laughs> emulate anything like this or to write a book myself. Uh, I think if you study it deeper, it allows you the chance to, to bring up other highlights of human personality, of psychology, of people in groups, of the dynamics of power, of propaganda tactics, of leadership, of, of self-denial, of all of these sorts of things wrapped up. I think this book can kind of highlight them and show them in these real small pithy examples. So it's maybe a book that also needs a little back, background knowledge of historical context to really get the full out of it. Uh, Orwell, I think, was a wonderful observer of people, of systems, and of the truth. And I think he really exposed somewhat what was happening in the USSR at a time when people weren't perhaps too sure of exactly what it was, of where, of of why a system like that could behave in certain ways. And and I think he really did show that. So this is definitely one of the only political books I'll, I'll probably ever care about or recommend. Uh, I can't rave highly enough about it. Animal Farm by George Orwell. I'm giving a super, super solid 9 out of 10. It's worth reading. It's short. It's easy. And I think it packs a lot of punch. So that is it for today. My Mere Mortal Eyes, thank you for joining me to the end of this video. What are your thoughts on Animal Farm, on George Orwell, on communism? I'd love to know all of these things. Easiest way to do that is to leave a comment down below. But I would also just recommend checking out the Mere Mortals podcasts. This is a podcast I do with my friend Juan. And a lot of the ideas, the psychology, the philosophy that we get from our reading of books we talk about and of also just general life and putting things into practice of not just talking about stuff, but also seeing, okay, will this exist in the world, real world? Will this produce good outcomes? And so I would just highly recommend checking that out. The link is popping up now above. And with all of that being said, I do hope you're having a fantastic day wherever you are in the animal kingdom, in the animal farm. Kyle, ciao for now. Karen out.